something to take away after this session uh, because the honest answer to how to scale higher teams for early stage startups I don't know and I wish I knew but maybe we'll focus or I'll try to tell you what I've learned along the way and the mistakes I've made and hopefully there'll be something you can take away because most gyan is always needs to be very contextual so and nothing is blanket so like I'll try and cover that Yes, that works. Can you go back one slide? Next slide. I think there's some lag. Okay. Uh, I'll give you a quick context of Zomentum so you're able to correlate what I'm saying with. Um, the best way to describe Zomentum is a network of software resellers. That's what we are building. The way we are building that network is by giving these software resellers a sales platform. It's a very vertical solution um, it's also very SMB, which means our average contract is, say, $2,000 a year. So very high velocity sales. So the median sales cycles is like two days. Uh, in June, July of this year, it had gotten to like seven, eight days, right? Like that's, it's a very, very fast sales cycle, $2,000. Uh, most of, almost all of it is actually 100% inbound driven motion with a inbound sales team closing these deals by doing a demo. Uh, the geographies we cater to are mostly North America. That's where we started at least. Today, 65, 70% is still North America. The rest is UK, Europe, Australia, New Zealand. So I would say English speaking developed markets of the world is the market we are going after. Uh, yeah, with that context, also we've roughly 85 people right now. At our peak, we were like 100, and we've raised 17 million. So that's context. Um, we'll get this out of the way. I think generic advice is usually always true, which means hire fast, fire faster, when in doubt, say no. So all of those things that you will hear, always true. So, uh, but. What is essential early on is how do you pick who you hire? Uh, apart from the thing that you're hiring from one degree separation and you're, you as a founder are doing the outreach, even if it's cold, um, going behind those people. Um, but why would anyone want to join a startup, right? Like, and this is 2018 when we started up. Swiggy, um, Amazon was also like ve growing very fast. All of them were throwing money at people. And so one of the questions I used to ask everybody I interviewed was, why are you joining me, right? Like, of course I'm selling the vision, but SaaS is really not the typical sexy business to be a part of. There is no social capital associated with it. I think even today, right? You can brag about working at Swiggy. So for me, intent is what I judge, right? Like, and even till date, I think intent is way more important than anything else, like skill set, prior experience. At least when they talk to us at Zomentum, it does not matter to us. Um, but how do you validate that intent? Um, some of those things, like some of the questions I've come up with is I ask them to define the persona of the next company they're going to work at. Like, and it, I ask them to keep Zomentum out of the picture completely, right? Like. Um, and if somebody tells you, hey, I'm interviewing with you and, and Amazon, I know that that person has not thought through what they want. And they are only going to pick somebody who throws more money at them. Um, and initially, you don't have that luxury, right? Like, to be honest, you cannot throw money at the problem. Uh, and actually, whenever we've thrown money at the problem, it's not worked out also. Um, so one is like, why? what are you looking for? Um, one other question that almost always works is, what will make you say no to us? Um, and most, more often than not, the answer is money. And then you also know that, that that's not the person. Uh, what else do we ask? Why, do you, why us? What will make you say no to us? What are the other companies you're interviewing at? And mostly, like this sort of helps triangulate if this person is the right fit. And the last thing, perhaps, is 
12 months later, how would you define personal success? And if accelerated learning and that growth and the hunger to like just break things, experiment is not what you're getting out of it, then also like they're not right. And I've hired people who have said otherwise and have regretted it. So this is one of my biggest learnings. So today I just look for intent. Um, yeah, let's go into some of the deeper mistakes I've made. I'm hoping this is a safe space where I can talk about these things. Well, uh, the other context I should give you about Zomentum is I'm not from the industry. Um, I had nothing to do with the industry. I don't think I heard about it even eight, nine months before I started up, right? Like, that's how new I was to it. So there was this whole fear of, I don't know. And everybody we spoke to selling to the same persona had spent 10, 15 years doing this and then jumped ship to start up. So there was this massive fear I used to live in that we don't know anything, how will we do it? And the way I would go about early on is interview people from competition. Like float a job description, people from competition will apply, you interview them and you figure out. And in one of those interviews, some guy just made me and my co-founder feel just so small, right? Like, like you don't know anything, I know and I'm going to change everything, I'm going to get you access to customers. And then I took that story and sold it forward to investors. This was when the seed round was happening. And we knew that in two days, like we made the offer, he joined us and then we were like, this guy doesn't know anything. Uh, any double clicking on anything we asked him, he had no answer. None of his connects were actually real. Um, and for me, the fear to fire then was because I had sold him forward and what if my seed round falls through and I needed the money at that point. But we took the call somehow on third day of him working, I actually fired him. Um, it was very tough, one, to face it myself that somebody who had kids and all of that has left everything and come to us. He might be vaguely using fraud, but it was in the best interest of the company to do that. But ever since anybody who tells me that they will come and change the fate of the company and that we are doing everything wrong, I've hired a few more also after that. I've fallen into the same trap, but they've never worked. Um, so I think you know when you're making the hire, but I think, I would think like fear is the worst decision to make any hire or worst reason to make any hire. Huh. So the early team, uh, the other context here is I used to do all business, go to market, uh, find and product my uh, co-founder, he's done product and tech and that's the distribution bet between us even today. So the first hire we made was a design person. Um, so, and we didn't code for almost first six, eight months of starting the company. I know coding is the easiest thing to do because it's a very tangible way of measuring progress. You've two lines of code today, tomorrow it's 200. You feel like you've made growth. But we were, we didn't want to do that. One, we weren't from the industry. So we're like, we had to figure what needs to be built. What is that one problem that everyone said, yes, this is what we'd like to solve. And we didn't start writing code till we got, I think around 400 early signups or whatever that wait list you want to call it. And before that, we spent money doing events and I did a webinar with an influencer. We had no product. And that time, I think Figma and all were also pretty new. I almost I made it in a PowerPoint and I projected full screen for it to make look, to look like a product, right? So uh, the early team was design. And after that, I think a couple of engineers. So it was the three, four of us very early on. Then a few engineers, uh, and I mean, as a founder, you're doing the sales, right? I think I didn't hire, until we had like 50 paying customers, didn't hire any salesperson, created three different email IDs of pre-sales, sales, and support. Um, and what would be the same person jumping from one portal to the other to support that customer with my co-founder sitting in front of me across the table and telling, don't click here, this is going to break. 
um, and we used to sell on Zoom before it was cool to sell on Zoom also because we tried in person and for roughly, at that time we were $39 a month. The customer would just get spooked, like who are these people who want to meet us in person to sell a $39 product? So we had to adapt to online sales. Even when we were in the US, they'd be like, we'll just do Zoom, right? And because our personas, they're also techies, which means they don't want to talk either. Uh, they want 15 minute demo, want to be done. They don't want any story. Like most of these sales uh, information available will tell you, anchor what value you can provide. These guys are like, this is my problem. Show how the product solves it and move on, right? And they would make that buying decision, which is why our sales cycle today is also like two days. Um, so yeah, that's the early team. On the sales front, when I started hiring, I hired two people, one in the US and one in India. I mean, that's something I think we should all do that hire two salespeople at the same time so that there is competition. Otherwise, one person sort of determines the rate at which you do things. But one learning, I think two, three months in, uh, because I was training them, I was telling them what pitch had worked for me and because I'd been doing it, we saw that the India person at one-tenth or maybe cheaper did a lot better than the US hire we had made. And so till date, we just use that playbook and entire sales team is based out of India, which is SDRs, AEs, and customer success now also is all based out of India. Um, that's the early team. Anything I'm missing in the early team? Product, we didn't hire for product until we were like 10, 15 people. Marketing, I should have hired slightly sooner, and I think I, I'll cover this, but uh, I made many mistakes in marketing. Um, but like one of the things I would fix probably is the next person I'd hire after design is marketing. In vertical industries, probably not so much, but when it's horizontal, you need to run campaigns and validate if people are coming to you, at what funnel they are dropping off. And I've seen a bunch of founders say that, okay, this is why people come to us. This, uh, they're clicking on the ad, they're spending time, but not signing up or booking a demo, right? And then some funnel optimization helps figure product market fit as well. The biggest thing I've fallen for, yes. Sir. Because you're as a founder telling them what you need. Um, so this design person also was like very junior. We didn't have money to pay anyone anyway, right? So I want to say like a three, four lakh design hire uh, who was almost some basic UIs and we were only doing screen designing, right? We were not actually building it. So we had the time to iterate on UI UX and mostly in such niche B2B industries, I also don't think like UI matters too much um, because our competition also is like on-prem solutions even till today. So we are anyway 10x better in whatever we do just by the look of it. So we just needed to figure out and the early mocks were also very vague and meant to be like that because I wanted to see where people are saying, okay, show me more, click that button. And we had like three, four journeys, which would let like people dictate and then figure out which journey most people are taking, which is what we used as our wedge in initially. Uh, yeah, what I've fallen for the most is English. Uh, or people who communicate well in English, especially US. I have not managed to crack US hiring till date. And I don't know what I do wrong. Uh, People, yeah, like this is, I don't know the answer, but like please don't fall for English if you can yourself. Uh, I, like I had this moment when we, we have three hires in Europe right now, and one is UK who speaks good English, but the other two are Belgian. So their English is actually not very good, but in my mind, I, and this is like I think cultural conditioning that I still think that they are more superior than most Indians that we evaluate, and I'm, willing to forgive their English. Um, and in US, like sometimes in 15 minutes, I know that I want to hire this person. But none of those have actually worked out, right? And it sets you back 
a couple of quarters at least when you make a hire in the US, the entire team morale goes down and then it feels like, okay, it's a market we are selling to, but we are making hiring mistakes there and it really bogs you down as a founder as well. But don't fall for English, that's all I'll say. Whom? They all join and I have fired all of them. Uh, how soon I have fired has been, you probably know in a week, then you have to give them three months. But you, the thing is after that also then you have the severance of two months that you have to pay out. So six month cost is gone. Uh, and when, at least when I bring in a leader, I'm like, I want you to take charge and I will not interfere in the way they would like to run their team, right? Because that's the trust I have or I, I would like to have. And so for the team, it's just like very weird. That's how you come, you came in, you put somebody and this person is again gone and then we have to find some other leader and I'm filling in. It's, it's, it's really bad with leaders, right? Like I have had situations when the entire team has said, if you don't fire the leader, we are all leaving. I've also had situations where I have then involved the team in all the hiring process of the head of the department and they've engaged unofficially during their notice period but have not shown up on the day of joining. Uh, so I don't know, that's why I said I don't know what to do, but I have gone through all of this and so it doesn't affect me as much, but I'm sure it affects the team. Is this a US-India team conflict that the salespeople were Indian and the leader was US and that led to a conflict or? General? No, in US has mostly I've been wrong. Uh, and so I've known that this person has to go because we'll cover this, but uh, like a VP of sales, right? The reason I hired my VP of sales is during my series A, I had told the investors that one of the things I will do with the incoming money is hire this person as VP of sales. And so I went ahead and did it. There was just no need of that person. Two, the person had ma was managing a $500 million book of business. And there was no chance that a company that probably was doing 400, 500K in ERR needed that person, nor that person could execute, right? It's a misfit. It's not that person's problem, but, and I felt like I was punching above my weight, right? Like this person's wanting to work with me was a big deal in my head. Uh, we did a bunch of PR, very celebrated in the industry as well, but just not fit for the stage that we were at. And maybe you will cover this later, but the, like the kind of question we were telling initially that, uh, what other companies are you hiring for? Where do you see yourself 12 months down the line? Is that equally relevant for a senior hire? Is this more for a junior hire? Like the questions will change, right? When you're looking at a VP of sales kind of a persona. Uh, I mean, I don't think we have VPs even today. We've done away with VPs, uh, but the highest title we have is that of a director. And titles are immaterial, but it is what it is. Uh, today I insist on working on one problem statement together for especially the senior ones that this is, and it's a real problem that we're probably facing, uh, and say how will we work through it, and we don't need the right answer, and this is more to see how we both handle conflicts. Um, yeah, because some leaders are actually who've hired, what they say is they'll come first two, three months, they'll do a bunch of things, and now they'll be like, oh, we've just set it up, it will work. And I'm like, what? So it's such a big red flag, right? Like. You need to iterate, you need to figure like what you've done is right, how do you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and most will also say that, hey, I did this at my past talk, so I'm doing it here and I've set it up, it should work. So the other thing in hiring really has been that people who come from companies where the product has just worked are typically bad hires or at least have been bad hires for me. Um, and I hope I don't offend anyone in the room, but say like a browser stack or fresh work, like these companies did really well and everyone grew whether or not they did a good job. Um, so people who've come from companies that have actually struggled, bootstrapped companies, who've just done everything possible to make it work at that point are the best hires or the ones who have the intent, right? Um, at Zomentum, you will see that people churn out in the first six months or they stay for three plus years. There's only two categories. Um, and that's because the way we operate, my, both my co-founders and I are people who we throw in the deep end and they find their way are the ones who thrive in the company. 
uh, and we want those kind of people as well, right? Like there's no time and if there's time, there's just no headspace to actually handhold somebody. And maybe I don't know how to handhold also, right? Like I'm a first time founder, I'm figuring this as I go. And I can tell where I want to be, but somebody is hired because they're expert in that specific domain or are willing to figure that particular domain themselves. Uh, yes, we, we uh, early on, like somehow I, you are selling the vision as a founder, right? but, but beyond 10 hires, when you post on LinkedIn in India, the reality is also that you'll probably get 500, 600 people applying for a post and there is no way to filter. Uh, that's for pay, where people apply, but I also like somehow debate the quality of those applicants myself. Uh, and a recruiter makes so much difference because as you cut down and you're able to sort of operationalize how filtering is happening and what they are asking to figure the right people. So I didn't do this. Uh, I've trusted an agency for the longest time. Our recruiter came in when we were maybe 25 people. We had an HR generalist who would sort of double up, but if I were to do it again, I would first hire a recruiter uh, slightly earlier in the journey. And also probably overpay a bit for the recruiter. I think like 15, between 10 and 15 you start looking out. There are very few good tech recruiters also, and good SaaS recruiters. Uh, most will come and tell you that the universe of SaaS companies in India is also very limited, right? Like when you want to hire for roles like product marketing, it's probably a very new role in itself. So how do you find somebody who's good at it? Uh, in, even in this, like people who worked at IT service companies works really well, or in the SDRs, people who worked at call centers and have a work ethic, because in our SDR team, I think the churn was like four months. People would just leave. And this was a problem for two years. Now we hired somebody who was, who was a chef and wanted to do something in tech, and she stuck around for two years now. And like this offbeat profiles and sales have worked for us at least. Uh, how would you, what are the traits of a good recruiter? I mean, how do you, how do you onboard them? I that is one. Know. That is one. Second, um, you'll be hiring across roles and across functions, right? So they'll also come from a um, specific function. So uh, how do you find that generalist fit also? Yeah, so I think Charge P at some point had hired like a ex-founder as a people officer or something like maybe I have not managed to find, but maybe somebody who is just interested in recruiting. Uh, so we hired a tech recruiter because at that point we needed more engineers and I was more involved in business hires and even till date, right? Either me or my co-founder have to interview everyone. Uh, and if we, we, or anybody in the process says no, it's a no. But if, we, they, if they've come to us after four or five rounds and we say no, it's still a no. Uh, what you want to avoid for is waste of four or five hours of time. But just like smart, high IQ people and like my current recruiter is perhaps the best we've had and she's fairly junior. So on paper, one would think that you want to hire someone with experience who's able to figure it out. But I think she's a psychology graduate, which helps. Um, so just people who have not done the thing, but are hungry to do it in general is true across the board. Like moms who want to go get back into the workforce are the best hires. They have a work ethic, they'll get their job done, done on time also. So I really like hiring them, right? Like if anybody tells me that it's almost a bias, I have to hiring them. been very subjective uh, and a lot of founders also reach out how to do it. I don't know. Uh, early on actually, I don't think any of our early hires actually valued the stock, to be very honest. Uh, because I don't think they trusted us as founders in the first place or why would they, right? Like from their point of view. 
So we gave away stock initially to engineers and everyone in the first, I want to say first 30, 40 people, everyone had a lot of stock. And then it never mattered to them. Like if we gave more stock during an appraisal cycle and telling them that, hey, Series A is happening, you're getting this at this value, just nobody cared for it. Uh, mostly engineers, and in the US, like when you talk to founders in the US, it's very different, right? And in Silicon Valley, they'll fight for that equity more than they'd fight for the cash. At least I have not seen it. Uh, now, as things have started to get better, people come and ask for equity, because last, this cycle, we didn't give a pay hike, and people came and negotiated equity, which I felt good personally, but I don't know what will make people ask for that equity early on. If I start up second time, maybe they have credibility and they will trust it. But early on, nobody did. And at some point, we stopped giving also. OK, we have five minutes, I think. Uh, team building post PMF. Of course, don't make that VP of sales higher. We also relied a lot on consultants. In the US, when it was stopped working at some point, I said, I'll bring in consultants who will do the job. And there's just no skin in the game. Uh, I would not do it again. And it, there was a point when my team members used to come and tell me that we have just too many consultants, and we did have a we did have too many consultants in the company also. Um, so at least today we've gotten to a point where we have no consultants. We should have done it sooner. And most of these consultants, one thing I realized is that they were doing things on things they could brag about. So in marketing, they'll spend a lot on brand marketing, uh, which today, till date, I don't buy that. Uh, but maybe performance was where we should have invested earlier on in a lot more, or maybe community building, which they didn't sort of invest in. Um, maybe just wrong hiring in the US, even consultants wise for me then. Uh, chief of staff. Uh, I hired a chief of staff post series A, uh, and a little, like few months into that. If I had a choice, I think I would hire a chief of staff slightly sooner. A lot of the things that I wanted to get done but had to do them also got taken off my plate. Um, and also now we have that whole good cop, bad cop strategy where he go and figure out things and tell me and then I know what to do when I go in. Um, so I would probably hire the chief of staff slightly sooner, not in the first 10, 15, but after that I would have hired a chief, a chief of staff. I don't, anybody here struggles with firing or think you will not be able to fire? Okay. Uh, I'm pretty ruthless about it. Uh, we've, uh, like the first proper hire that we'd made also, I let go of him in, on day three. And in, uh, to, we've come to a point where I've made my co-founder also so comfortable with the idea that even engineers are let go in the company. Like there is, like usually companies don't let go of engineers, like they're always there. Because I think it's not personal. It's never personal. Um, Somebody is a misfit. And that's why you're letting them go. And whenever I've had conversation with the people that, hey, this is not working out, they've agreed. Like one person almost said, I have not been able to look you in the eye for the last one month because I knew I was not doing a good job. And somebody needs to take the call. So I'm very confrontational as a person otherwise also. So it helps. Um, and. Then along the course, one of the things I read was that whenever you give somebody feedback, it should never come as a surprise. And so then I make it a point now to be honest about what I feel and what's going right or wrong in every weekly catch up that I do with these people. And one thing I do personally is for heads of departments, I write down every quarter what impact they made. Um, and it, it really helps because Inaction is probably worse than doing something wrong. And most people, when you have revenue coming in, you don't want to explore like a growth channel or it's just like, okay, life's going. And, and I think it's the biggest reason for failure, at least in my head. So now if inaction is worse, so we'd fire for two reasons. One is inaction and ours is just misfit for the stage that we are at versus what they are good at. Yeah, I mean, yes, yes. How much time do I have? Yes. How do you balance between after firing, right? There is that period where that space is vacant, right? So 
one lot of times right we hold on to it because till the time we find another person uh, we should hold that position so how do you balance between firing and filling that vacuum my chief of staff fills in as the like he and i together but mostly he'll be the face to the team and chief of staff yeah the answer is chief of staff uh, and whenever i've held on for the reasons that you're saying and i have done it as well it's then the team starts coming to you and they start giving you feedback right and it was one of those situations where i was holding on for interviewing silently in the background uh, that's when the one when department the team came and said we are all leaving it's us or the leader so it's okay like i don't think any one person makes or breaks anything that's true of people inside the org and who would potentially come and join as well and one more question how well before do you plan for a role and you start hiring what is your lead time it's always it should have been yesterday <laughs> don't do a good job of it uh, we know but till it becomes a burning problem when i don't prioritize it's my fault and i'm trying to change it but yeah i don't think i've done a good job one final question sorry we just starting short yeah how do you filter out cvs when there are like more than 300 applications so do you use any tool or do you ask some uh, employee to you know just filter out manually or do you have any stage like after this number of employees we will be using tools so any idea on that at what stage so are you currently using any tool for filtering out the cvs i'm not aware maybe the recruiter is okay okay yeah and i hope the recruiter is using something because it's just and it's not 300 for it's almost 700 800 for any role it's like it's wild the number of people who would apply to a role the problem is most of them are not even matching the criteria and at some point you just don't want to post or don't want to even look at those roles right mm -hmm. uh, or those people who have applied uh, one last question so you mentioned that you uh, take feedback from all the people or you give feedback to the employees every quarter right so that uh, any feedback does not come in surprise so uh, when the team is very big so how do you maintain manage giving feedback to all the employees it's not very big we are 85 but i give feedback to my direct reportees mm -hmm. and i tell them that they should be doing it and i wouldn't know how many of them are actively doing it but every week i'd say hey this is the goal we had set for ourselves like say for example the goal is growth growth is not happening and it's perhaps because of these reasons and if that trend continues for the long time and it's not showing in outcomes right goal setting yeah i think i missed it but there should be a output measurement number most people will tell you input metrics uh, and i just don't care about input metrics when i talk in my weeklies at least sure thank you thank you